Richard Flaherty, the giant killer. He always said he wanted to be a military. He always wanted to be a military. And he, and he knew at the time that his height might prevent him from getting in. And uh, matter of fact, the first time he applied, they turned him down. So Walter, at this point, was a lawyer. So he asked Walter to write the congressman and have the politicians put a word into the army about this little guy who's, you know, he wants, he wants to do this. And uh, they finally approved it. It took a couple of years. And then when he went, he was underweight. And he, he said, they told him, you know, you have to gain some weight. You have to beef up a little bit, which he did. And he started lifting weights and everything. And they were going to let him in with his height. He, he was just too skinny at the time. Yeah. So he did. He did that, and he beefed up and uh, worked really hard. And, and he told him, he says, I can do it. I can do it. Why just give me a chance? I can do it. And he was the littlest person in the United States military. Uh, he got a special con a congressional waiver, I guess it was, to go into the military. He never made a, a complaint about boot camp or about it being unfair, or that, that it should make some sort of accommodation because of the height disadvantage. He would jump out of the plane first, they'd watch to see where he went, and then they'd circle around and jump the rest of the company after him. You're going to exit an aircraft in a special forces training operation. Uh, you're going to be carrying generators, you're going to be carrying weapons, you got your parachute system. So you'd be jumping anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds easily. You know, so that's a lot of stuff to carry. When you're only four foot nine, it's that much harder to carry that. In fact, his his rucksack, which you strap down below your reserve parachute, it had to be close to hanging on the ground. So for him to get out of the aircraft with his rucksack down here on his shins. That's pretty tough to move. You know, the rest of us, it was maybe at our knees, but he, he would have had it down close to his feet. But, so it's physically harder for him to do that. I would have never even questioned his ability to do it because just from the standpoint of who he was, I mean, he's just tough, so he could do it. He, he did it, you know, and that's, that's hard training. That's hard stuff to get through. There's a lot of guys to this day that put in for SF training and never make it. A lot of guys put in for, you know, uh, 101st Airborne stuff, and they, they never make it. But you saw those pictures that you had of him with all his military stuff on, running with a rifle. And the, and the caption was, I think, smallest man in the military. That's when we arrived. When you first got to Vietnam. Right. Well, we didn't know what we were going to really get into when we left Fort Campbell. We found out in a hurt, especially in January, February 1968, when the Tet Offense just kicked off. We found out right quick what it was like to be in Vietnam. Well, the first time I saw him, it was sort of funny because he was a real little guy, and we thought it was a joke to start with, but uh, turned out that he was our platoon leader. <laughs> yeah, I never seen anybody smaller than him on there, other than the Vietnamese. But everybody knew Richard. He stood out. For a little guy, he had a big voice, and you know his his, his voice carried. Maybe it was something he had practiced, but it worked. Well, was it a little strange to see a guy that small? It was very strange. When I first looked at him, I did a double take. But I remember seeing recon platoon going across the rice paddy over there. They were just kind of all spread out, moving across there. And he was right in the front, leading. Had his map out, he was looking at the map, and he had this big stogie. Stokey was bigger than him, but I remember he was leading and they were following. And to me, I said, he's a good leader. Uh, there was a doubt that he was in charge. I saw the respect that was there too, because they knew that he, he you know, he, he could be um, stringent at times. He always had that attitude. He had that tough guy attitude. Even though he was really short, he was always really tough looking and always uh, very outspoken and a forceful individual. But uh, he was very smug, too. He was very smug about it. He just had that attitude. He was a tough little prick, but they like tough little pricks when you're in combat. They don't want that, you know, milk toasty guy. He was full of fire, you know. They're always willing to go, willing to do whatever needs to be done. We would get these telegrams. Your son has been wounded. 
And then, then a week or less later, we get another telegram. He's back in action again. You know, so he, even the, his wounds didn't stop him from uh, carrying out his mission. That motherfucker's tough. Yeah. A lot of respect for that guy. He is a tough son of a bitch.